two riots in a single day and me in the center of both. I am so glad to be somewhere where it's calm and quiet and somewhere where people are not trying to kill me. Oh, excuse me. I skipped the introduction. I am Paul, a follower of Christ. And some know me as the apostle to the Gentiles. And I know who you are. Because when your pastor invited me to come, he told me that today that there would be those here who, like myself, have trusted in the Lord Jesus and who day by day seek to follow him faithfully. But there would be others who have come today to worship God, but who have not yet decided whether or not to commit their lives to the Lord Jesus. Whichever you might be, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit of the living God would just take the story of my life in these recent days and use it to bless you and use it to touch your own life at the point of your need. The story of my life in these most recent days actually begins with a great mistake on my part. You see, I am, am known almost everywhere as the teacher of grace. And even as I traveled through Achaia, Macedonia, and, and Greece, I spoke to people everywhere and on occasions even wrote to them that our salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone, apart from keeping the law, apart from accumulating any works of good or of righteousness. And God has so indelibly inscribed that message of grace and faith upon my heart that it grieves me all the more at the sinful error that I made. But you see, I arrived in Jerusalem and I was met by my brother in Christ, Peter, who is pastor of the, of the church here. And he asked me to go with four of his men to complete a Nazarite vow that they had taken to the Lord according to the Old Covenant. And he asked me to, to participate in the rite of purification according to the law. Now he asked me to do that because there are certain Jews who want to add the keeping of the law to faith in Christ in order to be saved. And by so doing, in effect, they destroy the gospel. But I agreed to do what he wanted in order to try to placate those Jews and to try to, to keep some peace in the community, I said that I would go and I would, would do that. I would go through the rite of purification according to the law and to prove to them that I, Paul, keep the law. Oh, why? Why did I do that? I do not keep the law. I've been set free from the law. I have been saved, cleansed, purified by the shed blood of my Lord Jesus upon the cross. And I have no need for the shedding of the blood of animals anymore. I, I have no need for the rigidity of the old covenant. I am a part of the new covenant through faith in Jesus Christ, which covenant was established when he shed his blood upon the cross. And that covenant I celebrate every time I partake of the Lord's Supper. Well, I want you to know, I confessed my sinful error to the Lord, and he forgave me, as he is always faithful to do whenever I confess my sins. He forgives me and cleanses me from all unrighteousness, and he did. And our God is not a vengeful God, 
But I tell you, I still reap the consequences of this terrible error of judgment that I made. Because far from placating the Jews, what I did enraged them. And while I was still in the temple, they came at me yelling wild accusations. And some began to pull me one way, and others began to pull me another way. And one man, man hit me with the back of his hand, and another clenched his fist and pounded it into me. I thought they were going to beat me to death right in the courtyard of the temple when suddenly I heard the cadence of Roman soldiers marching into the place. You see, their garrison is right next to the temple courtyard. And so when they heard the tumult that was taking place outside, they marched down in order to try to quell the riot. Now their intent was not so much to rescue me, but that was the consequence. They came to me, and they took me in custody. They bound my wrists with chains and my feet as well, and then they picked me up and put me over their heads, carrying me like a log, head first, through the courtyard and to the stairs that led up the outside of their garrison. As they carried me in that humbling way, I thought, <laughs> I see it again. <laughs> I see it again. All things work together for good. <laughs> for those who love God. For those who are the called according to his purpose. And I do love God with all my heart and I am called for his purpose I am called to be his witness and I'm called to to go and to share the gospel and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to men and women everywhere and how often in my life have I seen God take the bad and work it around for good and this time God took the bad situation of this riot and my ultimate captivity and he has turned it into good and he has rescued me by his mighty hand but I soon discovered that God not only rescued me but by this event God gave me an opportunity to share my testimony with this crowd of unbelieving Jews that was desiring to kill me. And so even as I was being carried by the soldiers up the stairs, I noticed the commander was right at the front of me, right near my head. As so over my shoulder, I said to him in Greek, May I speak to you? Now he was surprised that I spoke to him in Greek because he thought that I was an Egyptian rebel who had stirred up unrest before. But I said, I do speak Greek. And so the soldiers set me down to talk to him. And then I said to him, I am a Jew. But I was born in Tarsus. And then I said, Sir, could I please address the crowd? The soldier standing nearby chuckled to hear my request. And you should have seen the surprise on their face when the commander gave me permission. <laughs> but I was not surprised because I had already sensed in my heart that a part of the good that God was bringing out of this situation was an opportunity to share my testimony with many. And so standing on the stairs like an elevated platform before them, 
I called out to them in Hebrew, their language of their heart, which they immediately turned to listen because they did not hear Hebrew every day. The everyday language of the people was Aramaic and they only heard the Hebrew when they went to the synagogue or in some places inside the temple. And so they looked and listened steadfastly. And I said to them in Hebrew, I said, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, for I am also a Jew. I was born in Tarsus, but I was raised here in Jerusalem. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel, that, that great teacher of the law. And I became a follower who was the strictest in the traditions of our fathers. I was also zealous for the law, just as each of you is. Even the chief priest and the elders of the council will have to verify that they themselves gave me letters giving me the right to take prisoners because I was a persecutor of the people of the way, the people who followed Jesus Christ. And I captured many of them and put them in prison. And they gave me permission to go to Damascus to find Christians who were there and to bring them back to Jerusalem so that they might be punished. But as I was journeying toward Damascus, when I was just outside the city, suddenly a great light from heaven shone down upon me and I was blinded and I fell to the earth. And I called, I listened and and a voice spoke to me out of the light that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I looked up and I, I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Now, the men that were with me saw the light. But they could not hear the voice. And I cried out again to the Lord, and I said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he said, go into Damascus, and it will be shown what I have planned for you. And so when the light was gone, I was still blind, and I asked the men to lead me by the hand, step by step into that ancient city. And when I was there, a man by the name of Ananias came to me. Now Ananias was himself a Jew, a devout man according to the law, but he had put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And he said to me, Saul, the Lord has restored your sight. And within the hour, my sight came back as clear as ever. And he said, you shall see the righteous one. You will know his will. And you will hear the plans that he has for you. Now go and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so I did. When I left Damascus and went to Jerusalem, I went into the temple to pray. And while I was there, I was, I was caught up in a, in a trance. And, and there, the, the Lord Jesus spoke to me. And he said to me, Saul, you are to leave immediately because they will not believe your testimony here in Jerusalem. But I pled with the Lord. I said, but Lord, I, I am a, a Jew, and everyone here knows that I went into the synagogues weekly and persecuted the people of the way, the people who followed you. And they know that I stood by as your martyr Stephen was being stoned to death, and I was 
in agreement with his killing. In fact, I watched over the clothes of the very men who picked up the rocks and took his life. But Jesus said, Depart quickly, because I am sending you to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. But as soon as I spoke that word to the crowd, all of those who had been so carefully listening began to yell and scream, Take that man away! He is not worthy to live. And they began to tear their robes and they picked up dust from the ground and threw it in the air to settle upon their heads. And some of them began to even approach the stairway where I was standing. So quickly the guards took me on up to the top of the stairs and into the barracks. And I thought again, all things work together for good for them who love the Lord, for the ones who are called according to his purpose. And you know, although the crowd as a whole clearly rejected my testimony, I thought, Lord, within that crowd, could there be individuals where the seeds of the gospel began to take root in the good soil of their heart? Could there be people who later today turn their heart to trust in the Lord Jesus? Or in a week, or in a month, or a year? Because I have learned in the sharing of the gospel that you don't always see the fruit immediately. But when you tell the gospel of how Jesus, God's own son, left heaven and came to earth to die for our sins upon a cross, that after they buried him on the third day, he came out of the tomb and he rose from the dead, that having appeared to more than 500 people to prove that he is indeed the Son of God, the promised Messiah, that then a great crowd saw him rise off the earth and ascend through the clouds back to the right hand of his Father in heaven. How this Jesus will grant the gift of eternal life and he will forgive the sins of anyone who will trust him as Lord and Savior. And my friend, I have found out that that message of the gospel has power. In fact, it is the power of God unto salvation. And so I know that whenever I share the gospel, the ultimate result is that people will be saved. Maybe not right at the moment of the sharing. Sometimes it takes a while for the seed to grow. And there may be others that water, and there may be others that reap the harvest. But the gospel always bears fruit. And thinking how God used that riot and, and that my capture to bring about this marvelous opportunity to share the gospel with so many who did not yet believe. I think about you. Because I know that in this great crowd there are many believers, many faithful followers of Christ. And you have had, some of you are having right now, trials of your own. Times of great difficulty that you are, are enduring right now. And I wonder, have you looked for? Have you found the blessing? Or have you found the opportunity that is hidden in the folds of your trouble as I did? There I was, my life in danger. Yet in the folds of that trouble, 
God had hidden the opportunity for me to be able to share the gospel with the very ones who wanted to take my life. Now, probably your trials are very different than the trials that I experienced. But the principle works exactly the same. Where God has, has promised uh, to us that he will never send anything to us that is not intended for our good and for his glory. And so if you are in a time of trial and you have not yet found what blessing God has for you in the midst of your difficulty, if you have not yet discovered what opportunity is awaiting you to be able to walk in God's way and to minister to others, perhaps even sharing the gospel, you should look for that. You should seek to find it even today because all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, those who are the called according to his purpose. Now God had already rescued me. God had already given me the opportunity to share my testimony, but I realized very quickly there was another opportunity awaiting me. It was the opportunity to see God's providential care for me personally. When I was taken into the barracks, the commander determined that he was going to find out why it was all those people wanted to kill me. And so he said to the centurion, he said, examine him by scourging. That meant tying me up to a post, taking the robe off of my back and using a whip to lash me as they asked me questions until either I gave them the answer they wanted to hear or I passed out from the loss of blood and pain. As they were binding my hands to the post, I said to the Roman, is it lawful for you to do this to a Roman? Their eyes went as wide as saucers. The centurion went and said to the commander, we better be careful. This man says he is a Roman citizen. The commander came and he said, are you indeed a Roman citizen? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He looked at me with doubtful eyes and he said, my citizenship costs a lot of money. Where did you get the kind of money that it takes to buy a Roman citizenship? And I said, I inherited my citizenship from my father. And immediately he was afraid. For it was already contrary to Roman law that he should have put me in chains. And so he told them to loose me, to just place me in a cell until the next morning, and he would decide then what he was going to do to me. As I sat in a cell, I thought, you know, for many years, from the early parts of my ministry. I have often wondered why God allowed me, a devout Jew, before I was saved, to inherit a citizenship of Rome. I mean, it was so strange, it was almost weird. And I thought, but now, see again what God has done. He works all things together for good to them who love the Lord, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And I wonder how many of you have something in your heritage, have something in your background, 
It may even be, be something that you despise. Something that, that you have always wondered, why did the Lord let it be this way for me? Why did the Lord make me like this? Why did, why did the Lord let this happen earlier in my life? But you see, God can take those things that may seem strange and most unusual, things that according to our normal evaluation would even be very bad and evil. But you see, God takes all things. Not just things that are okay. God takes all things. Even the evil things, even the bad things that nobody else can turn for good, but God, by His great power, can turn them for good for those who love the Lord and who are the called according to His purpose. And you may have something like that in your background or your history. And if you have not already, I would encourage you to prayerfully go over your own history, to go over your own background, and especially to consider those things that in times past you've counted to be most unusual or even bad. And begin to pray about what God might do. Some of you have already seen that. You have already seen things like that transformed where God has used, used it as a blessing or God has used it to bring an opportunity for you to minister to others in his name but for others of you you've not yet seen that transformation but you can and so you pray and commit that very thing to the Lord and ask him to take it and let it be one of the things that God works for good, not only in your life, but in the life of others. Now already, God had rescued me twice. God had given me an opportunity to share the gospel. He had demonstrated his providential care. But do you know the very next day, God was going to give me a third opportunity the opportunity for me to be able to confront men with the reality of the resurrection. I was awakened in my cell with an order that the commander was having me brought downstairs to a meeting room in the garrison. He had already assembled the high priest and the elders of the Jewish council because he wanted to know what I have, had done to anger them all so much. And so he brought me down before them, and I met their icy stares. I began to plead with them to say, Brothers, I am your fellow Jew, and I tell you today, I have a good conscience toward God. And then a man that I did not recognize <coughs> gave orders to a man next to him to come and to strike me across the mouth. I was taken so much by surprise as well as, as the, the pain. I called out to the one who gave the, the order and I said, May God strike you, you whitewashed wall. You pretend here to judge me by the law but you command a man to strike me which is contrary to the law and all of a sudden everyone showed great shock in their face and finally one spoke up and said do you dare to revile the high priest and I said forgive me I did not know that he was the high priest. Because the scriptures say, you shall not revile a leader of your people. And I am sorry. But even as I repented before them, God let me see the crowd. 
and it was made up in part of Sadducees and in part of Pharisees. And so I called out to them. It is because I, a Pharisee, and the son of a Pharisee, have hope in the resurrection. And it is for this reason that I am being judged. And immediately there broke out among the council an argument back and forth between these Jewish brothers. Because, you see, the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection from the dead. And they don't believe in angels or spirits. But the Pharisees believe both of those things. And so they began to argue one with the, the other. <coughs> Finally, the group of Pharisees put their heads together and they said, we believe this man is innocent. And who knows but what a spirit has spoken to him and we dare not fight against God. And I thought, all things work together for good. For them who love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. But it's interesting, not just in that place, but I have often found that it is the resurrection that divides people. In my journeys, I have found many people that were willing to acknowledge that Jesus was born among many miracles and they would acknowledge his great teachings and even that he did a lot of wonderful things but when it came to the resurrection that a man could rise from the dead they would not believe and it separated those that had a casual acknowledgement of Christ from those who were really committed to him. Because I'll tell you, my friend, if, if a person believes that Jesus of Nazareth was stone cold dead when he was put into the tomb, and that he arose from the dead and then he appeared to more than 500 people so that people touched him talked to him ate meals with him and they all saw that he was once again a living being then that means that this Jesus cannot just be an extraordinary preacher or some other prophet it means he cannot just be the greatest man who has ever lived. If Jesus really rose from the dead, he must be God. And if he is God, then he has the right to determine the terms of salvation. And so when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me, he has the authority to say so. Not only that, he has the authority and the power to call men and women to follow him and in turn to give their life in obedience to him. And that is what they called the way. That is what they meant by following Jesus. Do you know, even in this place, the resurrection really divides us into two groups. Not right down the middle like the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, but even in this place, 
There are those who firmly believe that Jesus, God's Son, rose from the dead and in response to what He has done, have committed their life to Him, have trusted Him as the Lord and Master of their life, and now are following Him day by day. But I know that there are some of you I don't know which ones, but I know in, the, in a, a group this size, there are some of you who have not yet come to that place of commitment. Possibly because you have not yet fully believed in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But my friend, if he rose, as all the witnesses said that he did, that means he is God. It means he knows how someone can truly be saved. That means that it is he who has sent the scripture to say that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so, my friend, I invite you to become one who believes in the resurrection and one who would commit their life to Christ to say, I believe in my heart and I confess him with my lips. I trust Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And let me tell you, not only will he forgive your sin, and he will give to you the gift of eternal life so that you can live with him forever. But he will begin to walk with you as you walk with him every day. And you will become one of those people that is being talked about in the scriptures when it says, and all things work together for good. For those who love God, and those who are the called according to his purpose. And you will find that even in the midst of trials and tribulation and great trouble, that God hides in the midst of that blessing and opportunity that you can take a hold of and use it for God's glory, even as he uses it for your good. All of that can be yours if you will come to Christ. And so you can. Let me ask you just to bow your heads with me at this moment. If you have not yet come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but today you want to. You say, I do believe he's God's son. I do believe that he died on the cross for me. I want to trust him as my Lord and Savior. I want to give my life to the one who has risen from the dead. If you've not done that but you want to, then just in the quiet of your heart, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe that you are God's Son and that you died on the cross for me. And I believe that you rose from the dead. Jesus, this day, this morning, right here, right now, I repent of my sin. I turn away from them all. And I invite you to come into my life. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord, the master, the ruler of my life. And I want to begin obeying you. And I trust you as my Savior, forsaking all other gods or things that I have depended upon to save me. I forsake everything else and trust only in you. And I want to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.